a lot of kids give up on art really early because somebody told them that they were doing it wrong or or, or they didn't feel quite as accomplished or good as the kid next to them. And they're like, well, I, you know, if I'm not going to be good at it, I'm going to quit. And I, and I think that's a really kind of destructive attitude that gets permeated in, in the school system. Um, some adult will tell you, oh, you, that's not how you draw a tree. And I mean, yeah, that's garbage. You know, I'm, you draw a tree however you want. All right, I got Greg Newbold here, and uh, we've never had this, got to have this conversation. It's, you, we were gonna try a couple different times. You were gonna come down to Tucson, and then something happened, then Corona happened. And you know what? I gotta tell you, this is better, and I'll tell you why. I get to look at all those beautiful paintings in your studio, and for those people who are um, just watching, or listening to this, I highly recommend you go to YouTube and take a look. In fact, is that Maynard Dixon in the upper back? Which way I mean, this way yeah, that way uh -huh. who is that behind you up top way oh. up yeah that's a caricature of maynard dixon that was done <laughs> by my friend chris payne there you go okay I, I, anytime there's a dixon i'm going to be able to pick it out <laughs> yeah yeah he he tra i traded a an, another drawing for him for that piece. oh yeah that's, that's very nice yeah excellent that's so how are you doing in all this stuff pandemic wise well, we're we're staying healthy. We're, you know, we're hanging in as as much as you could probably expect, I guess. You know, it's uh, it's weird. In what fashion is it weird? Well, you know, I mean, artists generally are are sort of hermits anyway, so it's not like it affected my um, my typical work situation because I work at home, but um, everything else has shifted. So the spillover just is weird, you know, but it's a weird time. It yeah. is. It's, it feels it's, weird. It's and you're probably, you have kids, right? I've got three. And they're probably have been at home more than they have been in the past, right? They're well, one, one's married, so he's got his own place. Um, but m my other two are, are here in, you know, living in the basement. So yeah, good place for kids. <laughs> they, <laughs> They don't complain about the price of the rent, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they better not. <laughs> they better not. Uh, so, so where did you grow up? So I was born and raised here in Utah. Um, where though, specifically? It was, it's called South Jordan. Uh, at the time when I grew up, it was pretty, fairly rural. Lots of fields and farms and things around. And, uh, but now it's just all completely suburban. And where is that? Where's South Jordan? It's about, it's about 25 minutes from downtown Salt Lake. Oh yeah. That's fine. So to the cool. South. And when did you grow up? When, what was your time frame? Of, like, so I, I'm, I'm pretty much a eighties kid, seventies, you know, seventies, I was in junior high. And by the time it, we got to the eighties, I was in high school. Yeah. So I graduated high school in 85. And 85. And did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I've got uh, an older sister, older brother, and then three younger brothers. Yeah. And was your older brother, how old, much older is he? Two years. Yeah. So he didn't have to deal with the Vietnam issues at all. No, was, no, no. Off. We, we thankfully dodged all of that. It, it had wrapped up. Yeah. You know, I was in elementary school. I remember it wrapping up, but I didn't really yeah. pay too much attention to it and what what did your mom and dad do so my dad was in advertising he was an advertising executive um for uh, one of the bigger salt lake city firms at the time and uh my mom you know she had a, a part-time job on and off but mostly she was just home with us Mm -hmm. No, she got a bunch of kids, right? So that's you. There was what five of you? Uh, six. Six of you, yeah. So that's yeah, that is a full time job. It was a more than a full time job. You know, I, I would trade the advertising job for the being a <laughs> way easier job being an advertising guy. And so, does, was he an artist? Was your father an, or is an artist? N no, my dad. Like I said, he was an executive. But the interesting thing about my art exposure, I think, was 
because he was in advertising, he he rubbed shoulders a little bit with with creative people. I'm sure. And uh, and he saw that I liked to draw. You know that drawing for me is one of my earliest memories. Was drawing. We we went to a rodeo one time and. I came home and I wanted to draw cowboys on horses and lasso and cows and stuff. And, and they were probably terrible because I was probably five or six, mm -hmm. four or five, six years old. But I remember being very proud of them and I would like take the scissors and fringe the edges of the paper and make them look kind of Western. And, uh -huh. you know, it was just, it, those are some of my earliest memories is drawing. My dad would go to press checks at the newspaper or whatever and and uh, he'd bring home the end rolls of the newsprint you know these massive rolls of paper and right he'd give give them to us and and uh we'd go down on the floor of the the then unfinished basement and roll them out and draw big murals and just have fun with it and you was know. that not just you but was also your siblings would do that no too? you know my brother my older brother did it with me a lot. And then later my younger brothers, we're, we're basically all two years apart except for my youngest brother. And um, so we did it quite a bit, but uh, you know, there hit a point where my older brother discovered basketball and that was it for the drawing. And Girls. I just kept doing it. My sister never really drew. Yeah. Um, she played the piano and uh, you know, I, I kind of just stuck with the art. Were you recognized as a kid in school? Did early on, did your any of your art teachers, you know, give you an award or uh, recognize you for your art talent when you were in primary school? I, I think that that actually was a factor in me continuing because we had every year at school, they, had, they called it the um, school fair. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could do whatever art or craft project you wanted and bring it and enter it and they would judge them and they would pick a, a winner for each class. And so I think for three or four years in a row, I won my class prize. Wow. To the point where other kids were like, well, I'm not entering this year. Greg's just going to win anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and was that like second through sixth grade kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Second, second through fifth. Yeah, F sixth, seventh, eighth was in what they called middle school. So, uh, so your, second, rep was, your rep was right off the bat as you're the artist kid. Uh, I I liked it. I I knew I was good at it, and I think um, that motivated me to continue. It, it was fun. It was, it was what I liked to imagine doing, you know, when I wasn't in school. Were you good at other kinds of things in school as far as didactic kind of things or really uh, so creative I, stuff? I was always a pretty good student. I, I, I graduated um, in high school, you know, near the top of the class. But at the same time, people gave me some guff about the fact that I took a lot of art classes. They Did thought they that... Did they yeah. have art classes to actually take in high school? I did. Um, I, in fact, my senior year, the second half of my senior year, I had three art classes a day. Wow. Because uh, I had that many electives available to take. So I just filled them all with art classes. So I had a sculpture class, a painting class, and a, what they called commercial art class. And uh, I took those. And uh, so I had a pretty cushy senior year schedule. No math, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you knew, you must have known at that point that art was your path or you at least thought it was? I, at that point, I had pretty much decided that was what I wanted to do. I think, I think somewhere between eighth and ninth grade when I sold my first couple of paintings. Oh yeah, tell me about that. It, it was, you know, it was nothing big, but they would have little art shows. Like in eighth grade, they had an art show um for for the art students and and uh they had a purchase award and they gave it to me and i think that was like 50 bucks and so it was not like a lot of money but for an eighth grader you somebody buys your painting for 50 bucks you think that's pretty cool and yeah. uh so i think these that, are really fundamentally important things that happen to kids 
when they're in primary school. And I hear this story over and over again from artists, what you're telling me, which is one of the reasons I asked these, this line of questioning, because for whatever it is that affirming of, yes, this is your good and other people like it. And I think purchase awards and things like that, where you get a real prize in your case, money really sets the tone in your own mind that, hey, this is something I'm good at and want to follow. I've heard this story sure. a, lot, a lot of artists, which is really interesting. Uh, I've heard that from, from some of your other podcasts I've listened to. So yeah. it, I don't think it's uncommon. But on the flip side, I think um, a lot of kids give up on art really early because somebody told them that they were doing it wrong or, or, or they didn't feel quite as accomplished or good as the kid next to them. And they're like, well, I, you know, if I'm not going to be good at it, I'm going to quit. And I, and I think that's a really kind of destructive attitude that gets permeated in, in the school system. Um, some adult will tell you, Oh, you, that's not how you draw a tree. And right. I mean, yeah, that's garbage. You know, I'm, you draw a tree however you want, <laughs> you know, but, but, but for whatever reason, kids get discouraged and they quit. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's sad because anybody that wants to make art could make art if, you know, if they dedicate some time and effort to it. Well, I think all um, teachers have a great power that we don't even realize. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of young women that get X'd out of science classes and things because you know, they're treated differently or they're told, you know, they're not going to be able to do this just because really because they're a girl. And, right. And so they don't want to have to deal with a, a male dominated, you know, area. And so they moved to, on to something else. And I think it's it's, you know, hopefully it's changing. That we're I, recognizing I these things. think it's but changing. I hope so. Um, my my daughter is currently finishing her master's degree in um, archaeology. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's in science. Mm -hmm. uh, she got a uh, degree in geology for her undergrad and then moved into archaeology. I mean, she's been over to Petra in Jordan to do archaeological digs, like eight different sessions. I mean, it's, it's amazing what she's accomplishing, you know? So what I think is, there's... What is she going to do, do you know? What? What does she want to do with that degree, do you know? Um, well, she's applying to uh, PhD programs right now, so hopefully she'll... She, she would like to move into this sort of archaeological research and you have to, you have to be a PhD and be associated with a research university. So how did she get that interest? Was that with you going out on painting trips? Um, well, we, we went to a few of those types of places, but it, it all started with dinosaurs for her. Yeah. Um, okay. And, uh, and we're really close to uh, Vernal, Utah, where they have dinosaur national monument and, right. And there's there's a there's a ton of dinosaur beds in Utah, and we visited most of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on her insistence or just um, no, I did think you? weren't we all kind of dinosaur kids back in the day? I was. Oh, I forgot you did a whole book on dinosaurs, right? You yeah, yeah. Our, right. Our second our second book that my wife and I, my wife Amy, wrote. Uh, they're picture books. They're they're uh, to introduce kids to uh the styles of famous artists um by imagining a subject that they may not have ever painted like the first book was called if picasso painted a snowman right and uh and so that one was her idea she was on a trip with her sisters in france and they were at the picasso museum and and you know you're you're aware picasso was a multi-talented dude he could draw like the best of them Right. Before he before he switched to cubism, and uh, she just thought, "Wow, I wonder what a snowman would look like if Picasso painted a snowman." And uh, that started from there. Her sister said, "That's a great idea for a book." <laughs> it took us it took us a few years to find the right publisher, but it was a lot of fun to work on and quite a challenge, I might add. Um, I had to kind of mimic and channel the styles of all of these famous artists you know right to, what'd you do with to, all those paintings that you made out of this um there are they're in, in the back room in storage <laughs> i mean i pull them out we we take them to um elementary schools when we go in and talk about creativity and we have a presentation where we talk about the books and we talk about the different styles and how there's no right or wrong style you know when it comes to art you can just 
be creative and do what you want. And we kind of give kids permission to just do art, you know, don't worry about what other people think or what they say. If you like doing it, you should do it. You should follow it. And, uh, and I think it empowers these kids to just maybe continue with something that they like, even if other people are shooting them down a little bit. And is That's this, our, is this volunteering in like elementary schools that you go in? Well, and, or, yeah. I mean, I mean, sometimes, Sometimes they're volunteer uh, presentations, but a lot of times the, the schools will pay us to come in and, and give our presentation and, you know, pay for our time to be there. And, and That's so great. It's, it's kind of nice. That the system in, your, in Utah values art enough to do that. Uh, it, it's not all the time, you know, but we get asked enough to come in and do them. And, and a lot of these, like the PTA or, or the school will have an arts budget uh, and they'll bring in speakers once in a while to, uh, I think it's to just give a variety and, and mix up the curriculum a little bit. Yeah, I get concerned actually as far as with the coronavirus and kids that aren't going to be in school as far as with the arts, because I think it's a very difficult thing to really teach uh, remotely. It's harder than most things, I think. It, it, it is. We haven't yet done uh, one of these remote presentations, but I'm sure we could figure it out you know zoom seems pretty powerful here um so we'll see how it goes with this upcoming school year we had when corona when, uh, cor when corona hit mm -hmm. we had uh three or four presentations that were scheduled for the end of the year that just got completely canceled yeah and uh you know so we took a hit there and and uh it's starting to come back we just got asked yesterday to do uh one in september's it's an outdoor, socially distanced kind of arrangement. So yeah, that's cool. Well, that's great, actually. We, we hope it'll work. Yeah, if you can focus them in on the art and not the butterflies that are running around. And <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's they're supposed to have a number of different authors, so it's going to be a little bit like a, a festival, I guess, of, of reading. And it'll be, it should be fun. And so back to when you were growing up, so you knew you were going to go into art, or at least you thought that was your path. What did your folks think about you going into college as fun, uh, in art? Uh, so my mom's sister is an artist. She graduated with a degree in art. And, um, and so it wasn't like a foreign idea for my mom. Uh, my dad was in advertising. Uh, rubbed elbows with uh, some artists and some creative types. And, and so he kind of had a feel that, you know, there are people that do make a career out of it. And, uh, and he saw how much I loved it and how much, uh, how hard I worked at it. And he said to me one time after I'd already been doing it for a while, um, you know, I never worried about you making it in art because I saw how much you loved it. And I saw how hard you were willing to work to make it happen. And, and, and I had never heard that from him before. You know, there were a couple of moments where he's like, well, maybe you should go into architecture. That's drawing, you know, and I, and I right. thought about it, but it just didn't have the same appeal. Yeah. And was he like, you no, know, maybe advertising then if you don't do that? Yeah. You know, there's always that moment in your life where somebody asks you in the elementary school, well, what are you going to be when you grow up in that? And I remember writing it, advertising and the teacher asked me why. And I'm like, cause that's what my dad does. You know, yeah. I mean, it was just something, I didn't really know what it was, but right. at the time it seemed like a good deal cause it was good enough for dad, you know? Right. <laughs> and so where did you go to college? I studied undergraduate at Brigham Young University. Uh -huh. um, so they had, uh, they still have a, a pretty robust um, illustration program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I figured illustrators, you know, could make some money. I had no idea how fine artists made money at, at the time. And I still don't know how they do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they don't. <laughs> Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, but, but I figured, you know, I, I had, I had, uh, some heroes like, you know, Norman Rockwell and some of these fantasy artists. I don't know if you're familiar with Frank Frazetta, or, uh, -huh. uh, you know, some of these guys that whose work I'd seen and I was like, Oh, that's cool. You know, I could, I could get into that. And 
and uh, they had a they had a, a good program and and it taught the things that I wanted to learn you know realistic drawing and and actual painting and uh, you know it wasn't just this esoteric ethereal kind of modern art approach it was a real hands-on learn how to draw kind of approach right and did you know of Maynard Dixon before you went to BYU no in fact I th it may have been at BYU when I first discovered his work of course you know they have a huge Dixon yeah. collection yeah I do know 87 and, pieces they bought in 1937 for $37 yeah. you know Harold R Clark got the deal yeah. of the century he did. <laughs> And do you remember seeing his work there when you were there? Uh, I, I do. I don't remember exactly when I saw it, you know, but the big paintings, um, the, the uh, Depression era paintings that they right. have, I, I think those were some of the first ones that I saw. But then when I found his landscapes, I was even more enamored. And, uh, and you know, he's been a constant influence ever since. Um, yeah. One of my very favorites. So, well, and it shows because you traded a painting for a Maynard Dixon portrait in the back of your studio there. Yeah, <laughs> when I saw when I saw Chris, he did that as a demo uh, for one of his classes, and he posted it online, and I'm like, oh, I love Maynard <laughs> Dixon. <laughs> so yeah, we traded. And so you took you went right into the illustration in college. That was what you thought you would want to be as I, an illustrator. I, I did. I went straight in. They had a four-year program, and so I went straight into their foundational classes, and uh, started, you know, started from the bottom. They, they, you know, they require it, so you start from the bottom, and you you do the basic drawing classes, of, uh, perspective classes, um, 2D and 3D design. We had typography class. We had hand lettering classes. Mm. Um, so we kind of ran the gamut. Uh, you know figure drawing, portrait painting. Um, and then we got into more of a commercial application type classes where we'd get an assignment and have to come up with a solution and do the painting and all that stuff. So they had a business class, they had a history of illustration class, I took other art history classes. So we got a, a really nice broad uh, education from, from that perspective. And you were taking studio art as well? those kind of things? Um, so no, at the time they had uh, the illustration department was its own department. Hmm. So there wasn't as much crossover. I did cross over a couple of times and I took a couple of classes from uh, uh, a really renowned fantasy artist by the name of James Christensen. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with James's nope. work. You should look him up. He's really great, really great stuff. And, uh, and he was very inspiring for me because he was, he had the, he had the chops of uh, a really well-developed illustrator, but he painted these fantasy paintings um, in just such a uh, whimsical, beautiful way that I, you know, I fell in love with his work. Um, and so, yeah, he, I did take a couple classes from him. Well, I see some of that in your, you know, your illustrations. You definitely have that kind of whimsical sensibility to them. Yeah, I, I think so. I, you know, I mean, we're, I think as artists, you kind of end up being the sum, the sum total of all of your influences, all the things that you love. And, uh, and you can't help but escape. You, you can't really escape your roots, I don't think. Uh, hopefully you get to a point where you're just doing your thing. Right. Well, you, you definitely have your own style. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You can see your paintings a mile away. There's, I, I, don't, I don't even know exactly how to describe what I see, but there's a softness maybe to them, to the way that they, the sensibility of how you do the landscapes, almost like a E. Martin Hennings meets Maynard Dixon kind of a well, sensibility, which is I, not a bad uh, thing, right? <laughs> oh, that's not a bad thing at all. Anytime you get mentioned in the same breath with guys like that, you know, you got to take that as a nice compliment. Yeah, your clouds are, uh, I mean, you can't help but see a, 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 a similarity in the way that you envision your clouds as how Dixon did it for sure. And I don't mean that your clouds look like Dixon. I mean, you capture the type of clouds that he would have liked in that. Yeah. Scene. Yeah. I can see that. You know, I, I have, I have other influences too um, on the regionalist end of the scale. You know, I I'm a real fan of like 
Thomas Hart Benton, Grant Wood, and those. Oh, guys. I see the Benton for sure as yeah, well. For so, sure. so you know, they, they I think and all of those us too. Yeah, I see uh, both us very much so. I think all of those influences. It was interesting. I I was not aware of those guys at all, um, and I was in college, and I was already going down this road of sort of a you know, what I call a stylized realism where, you know, it's, it's a lot more about shape design. I'm not trying to necessarily depict everything as it appears, but, but, you know, design it and take those shapes and push them and, and become something a little bit more. And, uh, and I saw these Grant Wood paintings and I'm like, well, I, you know, everybody knows American Gothic. So I knew who he was, but I hadn't seen a ton of his stuff. And I got looking at it and I'm like, I love this guy. Yeah, no, he know? was great. He did a lot of things better than American Gothic in a lot of ways. I think. Oh, oh, the American Gothic's probably not his best painting. It's yeah, it's I, a great painting, but it's not one of my favorite. It's not my favorite Grant Wood painting. Right. And, I agree. and you know, so those those sensibilities that they were displaying in their work just really um, resonated with me, and and I think that I I try to incorporate similar things in my work. Mm -hmm. no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sort of um, tied down to uh, replicating realism as I, as it is in front of me, right. as, as much as it is being inspired by that and, and then going down over here a little bit. Right. I, I, I see that. And when did you, so let's just go back with the illustration because you graduate from BYU, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It, with a degree in illustration? Right. And so what do you do from there? So so I jumped right in. Um, I had a job uh, that got me through college at um, a, an educational software company. Mm -hmm. And we did, the, uh, we did the, the graphics for their software, for their, for their lesson plans. And they were these chintzy 16 bit graphics, you know, with the gigantic yeah. pixels and, right. and like 12 colors. Right. And, uh, and, and it was fine. And they paid okay for a college student. And by the time I graduated, I was, I was working there three quarter time so I could get benefits. And, and uh, so I stayed for a couple of years. And then uh, right at the, the time we were having our second child, um, we started hearing the, the rumors that they were going to shut down our department or move us all to California or whatever. And, and I started looking for a way out if, if right. that were possible. And, uh, so the day we brought our son home from the hospital, I had a phone message that said, um, congratulations on, on your baby. We hope you got the flowers. And by the way, you need to give us a call. <laughs> no. And I, I knew right then that, that they were going to lay us all off. Yeah. And so. Uh, <laughs> but you got flowers. <laughs> I got some flowers. We got flowers. Um, and so they laid us all off. Uh, I got a couple of months of severance. And, and, and so I, we kind of decided, okay, here's the shot. We're going to try and freelance this thing and see how it goes. Um, and that was in... Uh, 94. 94. And so you got married in college? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you get, you know, got married in college, right? Started having children right off the bat. Yeah. Now you've got to also earn an income. <laughs> right, right. So no pressure, right? Yeah, no pressure at all. <laughs> no pressure. And your dad and, uh, doesn't have a basement waiting for you. So he's like, okay, get out there. So yeah, the we kind of had to figure it out. And, uh, you know, it was, it's, it was rough at times. We, you know, we ate a lot of uh, mac and cheese and whatever, and uh, but I slowly started forging uh, the illustration career and picking up some some decent clients. And, so and you, right at that point, you said, "Okay, I want to do this myself. I'm going to be my own business guy." I'm going to. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I was looking for an I was looking for an exit plan to just start freelancing, mm -hmm. and because I had some friends that had had done the same, and and I'm like, okay. Uh, I could figure this out and and make some money in the illustration world and and, fi and figure it out. So that's kind of what we did. And we just started at that point in time, 
trying to do fine art at all? I, I, I didn't because that's not what I'd been trained in. Right. Um, that came later. And uh, so, so we just dove into the illustration markets and, you know, I started getting, you know, more book covers as advertising work. And you did a lot of book covers, right? I've, I've been a no, yeah, quite a number of book covers um, over the years and a lot of, you know, not as much now, but I did a lot of magazine work and, and uh, advertising work and, and uh, you know, you do things like annual report covers and, you know, advertising and stuff for the zoo and stuff for the theaters and, and. You were also uh, doing big corporation stuff too, weren't you? You did some, some uh, larger corporation things. I've done a few things, you know, I've done, I've done labels for, people like Heinz and uh, done things for FedEx and American Express and, you know, all the major book publishers and, you know, magazines like Boys Life magazine. And, and uh, so, you know, I've, I've been in, able to stay busy enough over the years to, to make it work. Were they using, starting to go to computers, really doing all the stuff on computers as far as illustration, or were you still drawing it out, painting and that kind of thing. So, so it, when I started, everything was done by hand. I, I painted in acrylic mostly. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd have to go get it photographed or you'd have to FedEx the original art overnight to the client and right. hope that it didn't get damaged on the way. And, and so you had to be finished at least 24 hours before the deadline so you could get it to them. And, right. uh, and uh, there, there was just a lot of logistics that I think have changed now that, um, you know, most of that has switched to digital. So um, in just to backtrack back to, to answer what you asked. Um, so in 2006, I lost my dad and um, that hit me really hard. And, and I had already been kind of in a, in a place where um, I was feeling a little stagnant, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to push my career to the next level and figure it out, figure out what was next. And, um, I, I toyed around with going back to grad school and just hadn't had the right situation. But, but shortly after he passed away, you know, you kind of have this epiphany and you kind of go, okay, what do I want to try and do with the, with the rest of the time I've got? And, Right. And, and figured out. And so at the time I thought, okay, well, I, I had taught some classes uh, at the university and, and uh, that was enjoyable. And, and I thought, well, maybe I'll go back, get a graduate degree, start teaching or, or uh, just see what happens. And um, so I found a, a graduate program that was uh, limited residency. So you just go, uh, you know, couple weeks four four weeks scattered throughout the year and then you do a lot of remote projects and things and and uh and at the university of hartford in connecticut um and uh so i enrolled in that and again as mfa in illustration and uh but but as i went back there they encouraged us to take some time to think about what you know what was the next steps for us in our careers and what kind of goals we wanted to make. And so I set two goals for myself besides getting the degree that everybody wants to see if you're, if you're going to try and teach. And um, one was to learn how to paint digitally because that, you know, that was the, the trending norm mm -hmm. at the time, everybody wanted to see digital. And, uh, and the other was to learn how to oil paint. So I had two goals moving through that program. And, uh, and so I've been able to accomplish both of those. Most of my illustration work, which I still do, uh, not as much as I used to, but I still do, is done digitally now. I paint in Photoshop. And it's super easy to deliver it. You just upload it and boom, it's gone. And you know, yeah. if, they make, if they make changes, you just make them and upload them a new file. Oh. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot more simple logistically to do that. 
but the thing that I think really enamored me was this was this concept of how to oil paint. You know, that was that was like a new thing for me. I'd painted in acrylic my entire career, um, trying to figure out what oil painting was and what it would do was was like this. It was an eye opener for me and frustrating as heck. And this was 206 that you. Yeah. So, so I started the program in 07. My dad passed in 06. I started in 07 that summer. And then it was a, it was a basically a two year program. I finished in 09. And you must've been one of the older students at that point. Was um, that actually, no, the, the, because of the way their program was set up, it, it's geared toward working professionals because okay. you know, you, you can't, pick up your life and go to school for two years somewhere. Right. So, so it was, it was structured so that you just come in for a few weeks a year and, and do the program. And it's, it's super intensive, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, it, 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 it takes a lot out of you, but it was great. And I met great people. Um, but most of the students were around my age, you know, uh, mid-career kind of people or people that were going back to get the degree so that they could advance in their teaching positions or whatever. Right. And um, so, yeah, I met a lot of great talented artists that are, you know, about my same age and made great new friends that I'm still in touch with. And it was pretty, it was pretty awesome. It was, I credit that decision as a turning point in, you know, what I'm doing today. Yeah. Well, that's really when you become a fine artist or the basis of the start of that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Because I did my first oil paintings at that time, uh, came really interested and enamored with, you know, what it meant to be an oil painter and be a gallery painter. Right. Uh, try and figure out the subject matter and the, and the scale and different things that are involved in, in, you know, doing gallery work. And what is that, by the way, I'm curious to hear from a, uh, well, what it is that you have to have for a gallery? I don't. I'm still trying to figure it out. But you know, people <laughs> assure <laughs> people assure me that 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 I'm going in a decent direction. So I keep following that. But I think the difference being with the illustration work, there, there there's like two sets of challenges: uh, gallery work opposed to illustration work. Um, the illustration work you get. Um, directive and, and, a, and a task there's a problem to solve that's that's given to you and a time and, and i and and in a lot of regards i love that challenge because it's like okay how can i take the problem that they're giving me and solve it and and make them love it or make them love it even more than they imagined they might love it and um and and so that's still an appealing challenge to me but, but on the gallery side, it's like, how can I paint what's meaningful to me and what I love and what, what I respond to and do it in a way that hopefully other people will connect with it. And, and so and that's, that's a conundrum, I, right? I mean, that is a conundrum. It, it, it is okay. because it, you, you can't not, you can't not acknowledge what somebody else might enjoy because they're the ones that are going to buy it right and yet you have to find this balance between what is it that i love you know i've heard before oh you just paint what you love and people will buy it no, no, no i don't think that's completely true right. hopefully hopefully <laughs> if you paint what you love um and you do it in a way that is honest then that shines through and then the people that see it respond to and they connect with it because it is honest. Right. And, and that's, so I guess that's more the hope, you know, I'm, I'm always going to paint what I am interested in and what I love. I'm not going to go, Oh, you know, so-and-so they want another Grand Canyon painting or whatever. And I mean, luckily I love the Grand Canyon, so I'll probably paint it. Right. But I'm not going to do it exactly the way they want it you know right well you've done that road you've done illustration right i mean you have yeah to yeah so it, you have to you know produce their what they are wanting and what they think and on a timeline and it's a different set it's a different skill set for sure sure it is and uh, you know and, and I, like i said i still love it like i've done four picture books in the last three you know three years and uh 
And when you say picture books, what do uh, you mean? Children, children's books. Children's books, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they're they're 32 page full color. Like so we're gonna look at one of these. He's gonna well, speak just, out. he's I'm gonna pull out. it out. He's pulling out a couple of them. And I know at least one of them was about dinosaurs too, if I remember. So so yeah, the I mean these are these are our, our picture books. So if uh, Monet was a monster was one, we're seeing a picture of uh oh that's cute. If and, Monet painted a monster, you know, here here's the dinosaur one you were talking about, you know. Yeah, that one. <laughs> da Vinci painted a dinosaur. Had to have Dino Lisa there on the cover. So yeah. The, um, so did so Amy that, get I mean, the front. Uh, did she get the uh, premier uh, authorship there? Yep. Written yeah. by Amy, illustrated by Greg. So. <laughs> and is that hard to do that collaboration with your wife on those? You know, it was it was refreshingly fun to do to work with her. Um, you know, for my whole career, it's sort of like she's the facilitator she's the one that keeps the ship from sinking and and keeps the logistics with the kids all in line and all that stuff and so now that the kids are you know grown we uh we had a lot more we, we joke because we we sent all the kids off to college and it was just the two of us for a year yeah and uh, and that's when we did the snowman book together and it was so fun it it really was a a fun creative. That's why I mean I, to me that's you getting to create. Yeah, it was like we had our own little book baby, you know. Right. And are those successful? I mean, uh, yeah. So the first one, I mean, it, they're not like New York Times bestselling level successful, right? But but um, they're they've done well. The first the the second book was ordered by the publisher before the first one even hit the shelves based on their pre-orders. Mm. So, and then, and then by the time the second one was done, they're like, well, we got to have a trilogy. So, you right. know, we just came up with new ideas and did, did new books. And where can people find those books? Uh, they're easily found on Amazon or any of your bookseller, independent booksellers or, um, who was the publisher that did this? They're they're called Tilbury House. They're kind of a mid publisher out of Maine, uh -huh. and uh, but they're you know they distribute nationwide and they're they're easy enough to find. You can get them on Amazon for you know really easily. And do you anticipate doing more of those kind of collaborations and different kinds of things? Um, we we hope to. Amy's got a a literary agent now, and and she's written a, a number of other manuscripts and and shopping them they're you know they're going to be shopping them around there's no guarantee there's no guarantee that i'll be the illustrator yeah. but i wouldn't writing, mind she's writing in the children's field yeah she writes picture books and young adult novels okay so she's she's uh working on her first full-length young adult novel well she's probably <laughs> I don't know. She's got a bunch of them in process. I understand that concept. Yeah. You know? So it's I I can't say it's her first because she's written. You know. You know. You know how it goes. It's like she's trying to get one to the point where it's right. the agent the agent will sell it. Yeah, I get it. And uh, but she's got a number of picture books that are in the works and and uh, at the agent the agent's looking at and you know how it goes. You get it to a point where they think it's uh, polished enough to send out to query. Uh, editors and and then out it goes and you see what the response is yeah my feeling is that the only thing harder than being a fine art painter is to be a writer I, um <laughs> i think that is the yeah the living as a writer i mean i write books clearly but i wouldn't want to have to pay my electric bills with it i don't even know if i could pay my electric bills with it. It, it, it it's challenging um but I think Amy's always felt like she was a writer and she just didn't acknowledge it until, you know, the kids were big. Yeah. And then finally one day it's like she sat down and she said, well, I've always been a writer. Might as well just do it. Yeah. There you go. I know that feel. So. And so when you finished this MFA in 209 and now you're consider you, you know how to do things on the computer for illustration, but you also know how to paint with oil paints and you're considering yourself as a fine artist at this point, what do you do at that point from there as far as gallery representation or, or do you just keep working on your craft? Well, yeah, well, 
when you say I know how to oil paint, I think that nobody that oil paints really <laughs> feels like they know how to oil paint. You can, let me it, rephrase it. You can paint with oil now. It's a, it's a process. I, I, I have some facility with oil paint now. Well, um, you have a lot of facility. Uh, it, 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 but it, it, it's an ongoing process. And I think anybody that thinks they have arrived at any juncture is it, just going to, they're just going to crash and burn at some point. You just, I think the whole idea of sitting on your laurels is just a recipe for disaster. So I, I, I'm clearly continuing to try and learn more and gain more facility with the, with the paint and, and figure out what it is about what I want to do and how to express that, um, that that'll clearly just keep evolving. Yeah. Um, but, but what I did do was, um, I, I, I did teach at Brigham Young University for about three years full time as a guest professor, um, which was a great experience. Was that There's an some, illustration that you were teaching? Yeah, yeah. So there, there is something about teaching that um, forces you to evaluate everything that you do and break it down into digestible uh, portions so that you can explain it to students and so in that regard it really reinforces the skill set that you've already developed and I've heard teachers tell me that the students actually have helped make them a better painter as well absolutely absolutely there's there's a certain there's a certain uh, freshness of their creativity even if they don't have the skill set uh, and and their ideas and and the things that uh, that they're creating are they're inspirational because they're 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 not coming from your head you're seeing into somebody else's brain which is always interesting and uh so in that way it was a great experience and uh so i did do that and at the same time continuing you know to pay the bills with illustration and trying to get some gallery presence going so i i got um uh, I got into my first gallery, I think in 2010, so about a year after school. Mm -hmm. um, what gallery was that? So it was called Williams Fine Art, which was then purchased and became Alderwood Fine Art. And they've since, they didn't last very long. And then I was in a couple of other galleries in the Park City Gallery and I was in uh, another gallery in town and then, um, landed at at the gallery i'm at in salt lake city right now called uh david erickson fine art mm -hmm. yeah it's a good guy it is a good gallery it is and and um and then and then you found me i did facebook i think is where it was Instagram. uh yeah i believe it was facebook yeah you saw saw a painting that you actually have yep. in your gallery now yeah Hey, the Hey Caropolis painting, maybe you can splice it in and people can yeah, see Yeah, we will. It. We'll show a picture of it. So, so that painting um, at the time was the largest painting that I'd ever done. Um, I'd done one other that was the same size. Um, and the, it was just one of those moments when you're driving by something and you're like, oh, I got to paint that. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> I do that and, with a camera sometimes and I back it up and go, I got to get a photo. And, and so we didn't have time and the lighting was bad on the way. We were, we were driving from uh, Salt Lake to St. George, Utah. And, and you could see this haystack in the snow, uh, you know, just off the freeway. And it, it's a bunch of tumble down bales, weathered, just, you know, sad, sad looking haystack. <laughs> But beautifully sculpturally wise, though. Oh yeah, beautiful shapes and beautiful contrasts with the snow. And I and I thought to myself, I, I have to paint it. So on the way back, uh, I convinced the the family to, you know, we'll pull off the side of the road and I'll tromp through the snow and take some photographs. And, right. and uh And so that's what I did. Took it from all different angles, close ups, you know, and and everything. And the lighting was great. It was a it was a sunny morning, and. Uh, so I got good shadows and good shapes and 
And uh, I get back to the car and, and uh, you know, my, my wife and my kids just roll their eyes whenever dad gets out of the car with the camera because they're like, well, we might as well put on a CD, you know. Yeah, no, and, I and they, they listened to the entire CD while I was tromping around taking pictures. Well, they know when you say it's only going to be a minute. They yeah, know just that. be a minute. You know, yeah. Half an hour later, you know, whatever. My kids used to hate when I'd run back to the gallery. I just got to do one thing and they'd be like, oh, great. It's okay. going to be an hour. I'll see you in an hour. <laughs> yeah. So you know how it goes. It's, it's, uh, but it was just one of those subjects that I, I think it stems back to um, the semi-rural upbringing that I had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a f family homestead um, in South Jordan, um about i think it's seven acres it was seven acres my great aunt lived on it and it was where she and my grandma were born so it was the family homestead and um she lived there she never had kids so uh, you know i i spent a lot of time there taking care of the animals and she kept the animals on the property so that she could continue to have uh, an agricultural zoning so that she didn't kill, get killed with the property taxes. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, they had, she had sheep and chickens and my dad grew a massive vegetable garden down there. And, and it was, it was our little farm oasis in the, in the middle of town. And, you know, we'd, haul hay bales in the summer and and irrigate out of the canal and, and uh it was it was a it was a cool place to spend time and now it's all apartments no Where actually <laughs> actually there are houses around it there's a subdivision around it yeah but but um my dad and and his uh brothers before that my dad passed away convinced the city to take over maintenance of the house and the surrounding pasture and it's a little bit of it's a little park oh, so, now, cool. so now it's a little park so the, all the barns and the outbuildings and the house have been restored on the exterior and supposedly sometime down the line they're going to redo the interior of the house and turn it into sort of a meeting place or something yeah that's cool uh, but it's still there howard post's family did the same in tucson they had a ranch and his you know third generation and they gave it to the city of tucson so there's that's uh, cool yeah, just yeah. Like so the, so i mean in in reality now it's probably the only remaining uh vestige of of what that town was like a hundred years ago hmm, that's really interesting and uh and so you know i'm grateful that at least it's still there yeah and so you finish you start painting in 210 you get it was 210 you got a gallery uh yeah i believe around that time period yeah, yeah. And so what's happened since then from 210 to now that's 10 years uh, soon yeah that went by fast didn't it <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah what yeah i mean well you you know i i would anticipate you kind of have hit your stride at this point um I, I i feel like i'm getting closer to you know quote unquote a stride um, I, I feel like I know some of the subject matter that I want to paint and, and I'm getting more comfortable with the scale of larger paintings. And, you know, up to that point, I, most of my work was, you know, 120% of reproduction size, whatever that is, you know, I didn't paint anything very large because I didn't have to. And, uh, so working at scale, I think is, has been one of the challenges that I'm, I've, had to tackle and figure out how to paint larger and and uh but i'm doing it you know i got that thing right there yeah. well you know it's funny i i i see your large paintings as being um i don't know they're, they're more intriguing to me i they seem like you're a uh, somebody who works better in in large paintings than even small you know well, some I, people are good and small like you know or you think of matt uh smith and you know, he can paint great. You know, he's one of the great. Oh, painters. Matt's, Matt's got a phenomenal technique. But his little paintings, he loves to do them. And you can tell, and they're some of the most complete. And, you know, and you have to push him a little bit to get the bigger ones. I almost feel the exact opposite with you, that the big ones are really, you know, where your stride is. 
Well, I, I'm, I appreciate that. I think, I think these next few paintings, I think I'm really going to turn a leaf and, and, and it'll become, it'll feel more, um, natural maybe, uh, it, it, it's getting to the point where it's not as intimidating, you know, when you compare this many square inches with, you know, right. this many square inches, it, it right. does get a little intimidating, but I, I think I'm, I think I'm getting over that hurdle. You're over it. You may well, not be over in your own mind, but I can tell you yeah. from a art standpoint. I over. appreciate it. <laughs> I can so, tell you. Yeah. I hope you like that. That uh, one I just sent you. Yeah. Now that we did a great little video, people can see this video. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that. That turned out really nice. You like how we made your logo? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. I thought it was cool. Yeah, I, I, well, and then the, the, the part that I really liked about that video was where it fades from the photograph to the painting. Yeah, that was all my videographer, Will. So we've got a couple of really great staff here. And I'll shout yeah, out. Yeah, he did. He did a great Pat. job. Yeah, he really Pat, did. Pat did all the, the, the voice, got, got the little bat sound bites where it needed to be. And Will did the video. And then I looked at it and said, great, that looks fantastic. Let's do a yeah. few little things and this and that. And, you know, and then you have it. And, it, you know, it's nice to have a real video that goes along with this major painting that took a lot of time to, you know, produce. Yeah, I did. It, I mean, in fact, like I said, because because I'm less interested in in depicting like a photographic rendition of reality. Right. Um, there's there's I think there's a lot more problem solving in, in the color and in the, the shape making and and um, just getting the temperature balances to feel right and because it's not just a it's not just a copy of a photo it's yeah, not at all it's uh it's this distillation of so many different things that uh, i i actually had to put it down for quite a number of weeks before I was like, ah, I got to figure this one out. And I went back to the smaller study and painted on it some more trying to, you know, solve some, some temperature issues and different things. And, and um, then when I pulled the big one back out again, I, I was able to solve it to, to a point where I liked it. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, you may have only been doing fine art for 10 years, but you've been a artist and, and creating and making imagery for, your whole life for 30 exactly and no i think <laughs> teaching art too i mean <laughs> teaching art for three years in a university setting also really sets you apart because you're just immersed in the whole process of painting right right and you're and you're noticing you know you're noticing your own weaknesses too as you try and um encourage these kids to overcome their own you know their own weaknesses i guess is it's like, hey, you know, play to your strengths, but don't ignore your weaknesses. Try and get balance in in what you're trying to do, and and uh, and so you know, I try to do the same in my work. If I go, okay, well, maybe I want to incorporate more texture into my my work, or or maybe I want to improve my my color relationships, mm -hmm. or or whatever. The, it, it it's always a, a new challenge. Like I want to I, I want to take a new challenge, like this one right here. Um, never done a nocturne mm -hmm. at least not a big one so this is a piece in his studio that we're looking at which is a, a rainbow bridge kind of a it's uh it's called corona arch corona it, yeah exactly corona <laughs> <laughs> so there's no timeliness there at all but yeah. you, i don't know my whole point idle that you may want to find a different title <laughs> actually actually my my philosophy on it was it was this whole thing was inspired by you know, Corona becoming the buzzword of the year. Mm. Uh, and yet this, this arch was, has been named Corona arch for, I don't know how long, and it stood there for, I don't know how many thousands of years. And so my, my, my thought was that it would, um, it's still going to be there when this all blows over. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, the Corona is a circle by the way, too. It's uh you know, it's a medical term, actually. So I'm assuming. Yeah, well, yeah. You know, and and it's a it's a you know it's an astronomy astronomy terminology too, yeah. the throne mm -hmm. of the sun and whatever. Right. And so, I guess my my thought being that 
uh, words get hijacked sometimes. They do. I mean, how would you like to be Corona beer? Ah, mm. yeah. Their sales went down a lot, actually. I'm sure it did. Yeah. I mean, it's just word association. It's got a, not a good association. And and so I right now it's titled Corona Nocturne. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about if that. Yeah, it's interesting. As a dealer, I can tell you um, that titles are immensely important in how people decide to buy things or not buy things. And I see it on a regular basis. They, a title can kill a sale or it can make the sale. And um, so, you know, it seems like a, something that wouldn't be that important, but it's immensely important because people immediately put thought patterns to whatever that may be, including if you go, this is a specific place in Utah, let's say. It is. I mean, yeah. this this arch is um, just outside of Moab, Utah. You know, just outside yeah. of arches. It's not in the park, right? Which is national park. Um, so it gets used a lot. Um, they put more restrictions on it, but it used to be used a lot for um, rappelling, and um, they used to do the rope swings under it. You know, where you just dive off and swing yeah. under it. And yeah. uh, they've they've put a lot more restrictions on it because they had people die. Yeah, I could see that, of course. And uh, but but it gets trafficked a lot because it's not inside the park. Yeah. People like paraglide underneath it and everything. I mean, so I mean, just in that form, if you called it the death zone, you know, <laughs> you know it's just not going to be as enjoyable as you know Utah Arch or whatever it might be. You know, the subtle moment, uh, you know, center of creation. You know, all those things. And Corona, I think, has a somewhat of that same sensibility as the death zone in a weird it way. It does right but, now. Yeah, it will for a while. I mean, when Dixon was painting those Depression era pieces and, you know, Harold R. Clark comes and looks at him and wants to buy him in 37, it was pretty revolutionary because, you know, Dixon's painting these more for himself. He's really not painting these to sell because who wants to buy paintings of Depression when you're in the Depression, right? Right. So they were beautiful paintings that Harold R. Clark could actually see past all that, uh, including whatever those titles, No Place to Go, you know, Pickets, Strike, all these kind of things, um, scabs. So, uh, you know, he was ahead of his time. He, he went with the art, but titles really, you know, they can, you know, they can make or break a painting. And I think, uh, I don't know if they teach that in art class, actually. Uh, I don't think so. I never got, I never got any of that, but then again, I I didn't take the studio art classes either. So, yeah, I mean, Dixon painted a painting in 1935 in in Nevada called "The Bank Wins," and it was this dilapidated old home. Right. Yeah, I remember that painting. Yeah, and they couldn't sell it, so he, you know, he changed the title, you know, to uh, "Abandoned Homestead," which he could then sell. And just, you know, nobody wanted to be reminded of the Depression, and so, you know. Some artists might say, well, that doesn't matter. The title is what I think and what I believe and what I feel. And, you know, I don't care if it's right or wrong and I can get that. I understand that. But um, I also think that just from a standpoint of you are making art to sell and to pay your rent, sometimes more uh, thought maybe needs to go into titles. I bet if you talk to other artists about this conversation, I bet they would have some very strong um thoughts on on this a lot of yeah i i i've i've got a facebook artist friend that that has talked quite a bit about how he didn't really change his paintings and but one day he decided to title them differently and he started making these sort of crazy poetic type titles to go along with his paintings and all of a sudden he started selling them like crazy it's true. And people remember those. I remember those. Well, I mean, even if you don't, I mean, you know, Stephen Yatz has one called Contemplation right now. And that's really, you know, that's a title I can remember, you know, or Dixon with, you know, um, you know, Earth Knower, you know, these ones mm -hmm. that there are things about a title that people are going to have a relationship immediately with that title, uh, which brings them into the painting. So, uh, I think it is something that needs to be thought of more uh, on a serious basis from that standpoint. Again, I'm never going to tell an artist what they should or shouldn't do, but sometimes if there's a title that's really you know, hurting the piece, I'll, I'll let them know. I'll go, you know, it's, 
it's the title people really are having a problem with your title so. well we'll have to have that conversation after we're done here <laughs> uh -huh. we are right now corona <laughs> corona view now just go with death zone it's just as good <laughs> so so where are you headed from here what's what what's your you know your plan from 2020 on do you know well i mean i've got a couple of large paintings that are underway right now and i think that the the hope is is that i can continue to do enough of those large paintings and sell them that you know it gives you a little bit more flexibility in in the other smaller paintings or whatever and and um just build just build on what i'm doing i i still feel like it's it's a new it's a new venture you know i'm still i'm still becoming known as a gallery artist right. um and uh so so yeah i mean if if i could be three four years down the line and and then all i'm doing is gallery work uh that'd be fantastic you know as it stands right now i i still fill in the gaps with some other projects and and uh you know i think it's smart to have enough irons in the fire that you can survive something like what we're going through right now yeah I, and, definitely i agree and so you know i haven't given up on any of my other avenues of potential income uh because right now that just feels silly yeah um, makes sense to do what works too but but yeah i mean the ideal would be look back and go okay i've i've completely established myself in the gallery art world and and people are liking what i'm doing and i'm selling and and it's affording me to continue to do it you know well i think from a collector standpoint um individuals like yourself are the kind of artists assuming you like the art to really want to find and to collect because you're still from a financial standpoint a price point low right you're still really affordable, affordable. <laughs> no it's true you're still affordable it's true there's, you can get a maybe more work. potential yeah i mean because there you can get a major work that you know uh, at a level that's going to be different. I can assure you, your paintings are going to be different in 10 years. They're not going to be at the same level that could continue to rise. And so- Well, I hope I hope so. Yeah, no, for sure. I'll make sure. Um, but- you know, Let's make it happen. <laughs> yeah. But it is true for a collector, if they can find somebody who, I mean, you have 30 years of painting experience, but sure. you might've only been on the fine art market for 10 years. Well, that's a great zone for people to go, okay, I love this guy's work and it's really affordable. And because I hear it, you know, 10 years later, they're going to go, oh, I wish I had a bot, you know, his work when- you Like know, I had a chance to buy that one 10 years ago and I skipped yeah. it. You know, and I hear, I hear that like people say that about Ed Mel all the time. And I tell, you know, I've represented Ed for like 22 years and I say, you know what? I heard that 10 years ago. I heard it 20 years ago and I'm going to hear it 10 years from now because it's still going to continue to march forward. And, you know, there's a point where you have to go, okay, I'm going to get in. Just like if you bought Amazon at a thousand going, geez, this is too much. And now it's 3000, you know, right. you know, great things of quality that there's only so much of, right? You can only produce so many paintings. Sure. These big ones, which take a lot of time, effort. You know, you just said on the one we have, you know, you've had to set it aside for, weeks just to try to get the right color composition, the warmth and the, the right value right. you wanted. So, you know, for anybody who's out there listening, you know, I highly re recommend you go look at Greg Newball's work because I can tell you they're not going to be at this level forever. Well, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm certainly, that's the goal. You know, I want to, I want to get to that point where, um, uh, you know, everything, everything goes out the door at a, at a nice a nice price right <laughs> whatever that price is but it's I mean, a nice price yeah a price where you can get your kid out of the kids out of the basement out of the basement you know go, go on a trip once in a while yeah nobody's well, I, going anywhere right now but someday yeah uh, well I, you know i see your work continuing to just you know progress and i can tell you i get lots of artists that contact me on a daily basis quite frankly who want to show in the gallery and how do I find you? Facebook, because I see it, right? So if you make sure. the work, if you produce the work, and this I think is a good 
a rule for other artists that are out there, you know, do social media and let people see what you are because people like myself are out there trolling. We're looking for things. Right. Like, oh, wow. Who's this person? That's amazing. I really, you know, it's just, they clearly have it. You can tell, right? I mean, sure. you know, if you're a good gallerist, you, you can tell immediately uh, when you see it. And there's been a lot of my artists that I found that I've never heard of before, you know, whether it was Francis Livingston, who I saw, you know, in the yeah, his stuff is great. Yeah, I saw him in the Smithsonian Magazine. I called up, you know, I found who this Francis, I thought it was a woman artist, and I, well, <laughs> I wanted to show her work. I mean, it was really <laughs> phenomenal. I could see the brush strokes, I could see everything about the work. And um, so, you know, for me to be able to connect that quickly on one, you know, just one image of a painting, I knew you had the stuff you know well i i appreciate it i i feel you know i feel privileged to be part of the group of artists in your gallery i mean it's like if i made a list of who's who in western art right now it's like they're all there yeah and, got good ones <laughs> yeah a really really good group of artists yeah and so i mean i feel privileged yeah no well you you stand you know you're right there and uh that's one of the reasons i try not to take too many artists into my gallery because I really want them to be a cohesive kind of group of artists that have that original voice. They have whatever that is. Um, and, it, and I don't look at it from a standpoint of money or how much sales. It's really that they have the ability to see the world on their own. That's number one. Two, they have the chops to be able to do it. And three, that, you know, they're nice people. You know, it's nice to work with artists that you really want to help and treat his family and you want them to go forward and I think everyone in my gallery has that uh, well I mean that's a that's a credit to you you know you've found, you've been able to foster sort of this uh, atmosphere in, in your gallery and your stable of artists that every, everybody likes everybody and everybody feels like it's a it's a win-win you know it's family you know it really is yeah. you know there and, and I get nothing greater pleasure in my life when I sell a painting, especially it's by an artist that maybe haven't sold a painting in a while. And it's like, yeah, you know, cause I know I just made a difference for them. Yeah. And well, let's, let's, let's hope somebody likes yeah. one of mine. <laughs> a new bowl. Yeah. Well, there's a new one there. There's a great Greg new bowl that we just finished. It's a brand new painting with a fantastic frame, I might add. And we did a whole yeah, that's on shout that. out to uh, shout out to my boy Travis uh, at Gold River Gallery because he makes the most beautiful frames. Yeah, he does do a fantastic job, and um, you know it's it's it was worthy of doing a video for him. We did, and we just put it just came out recently. So go check it out, Greg. Anything else you want to say before we let you go back to painting? No, I just really appreciate everything you do. You know, your whole crew, they've been so good. And uh, it's been uh, wonderful to work with you. And, and I look forward to, you know, a long, right. a long <laughs> uh, career moving forward with, with uh, Medicine Man. So. Yeah, I, I fully expect some uh, dealer, some smart dealer is going to listen to this and go, hmm, I wonder if uh, he wants to show with me. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just make sure they're a good gallerist. That's if, all. I say. And if I can make enough good paintings to supply enough yeah. galleries, then you know, great. But but right now, you know, right now I'm I'm focusing on making sure I get great work to you and uh, my other gallery, and uh, we we'll just see what happens from there. No, you'll just you're gonna just keep doing, just keep making art. You know, you're in the groove. So, you know, it's it's hard sometimes when you're in the groove and you're dependent on galleries to sell your work. I mean, that's a tough thing, right? I can tell it, you, it really you know, is. I mean, yeah. the, this stretch with the Corona has, has been, you know, more challenging than I expected it to be. Um, but, you know, I, I see good things on the, on the other side here pretty soon. Yeah, that's right. Just keep doing your thing. You know, we'll all come out of this. It may be a while. I mean, this is, you know, we're, we're filming this in mid August of 2020. And I expect that it will, we'll still have somewhat of the same sensibilities a year from now in 2021. It may be, yeah, that, but it's I hope have that same sensibilities to some extent. I hope it's, I hope it's eased. Uh, I, I hope people um, by then uh, feel like they can just live their life, you know, and, and, you know, just take, 
whatever precautions you need to, but like, don't not live. Don't, don't not buy art. Yeah. You know? I think you should live now. I mean, you know, just do it on a smart basis from a medical standpoint. Sure. Yeah. And I, and we, and we are you know, at big crowds and parties and things like that. Wear your we, damn mask, as they say. <laughs> we've got our, we've got our pile of masks that we uh, can choose from. And uh, every time we go out, we, you know, we have them and, and it's just, it's just what it is right now. Cause I'd rather, I'd rather wear a mask and not get it than be stupid and get it. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a simple preventive, you know, measure. So you come to our gallery, you're going to have a mask. You know, that's how it is. You're going to have social distancing. You're going to buy something and check out. We have big uh, acrylic guards that are in front of the, right. You know, which I had personally made with a great company out of Ohio. And I'll put that information on the end of this podcast that they designed for us as for art. So you could see the art beautifully. It was well constructed. It even has the logo on the shield itself. So it's not just some acrylic screen that you know I bought that you see in a supermarket or something. Where they like sandwiched it between a couple of two by fours. <laughs> yes, yeah, so th it's really made a very beautiful thing as for an art gallery. And there are screens for art, for art galleries specifically made um, it was one of my clients that we worked to, with them and they, and I said, this is what we need, but we don't want to obstruct the art. When we, when you look through them, we want to be able to see the art. So we don't want any big aluminum, you know, right. Cause we want it to be, and we want it to be artful and they accomplished that. So, That's awesome. Yeah, it really is. So, you know, those are the little details that, you know, make you safe, but also you still say, I care about those things, the aesthetics, right. the aesthetics are everything. Right. Well, I, I hope I can make it down to Tucson um, before too long. If I get a big enough pile of paintings that it yeah, doesn't come. make any sense to, to ship them, then I'll drive them down. Yeah, yeah, bring them. We, we expect to actually be quite busy this fall and winter, and it's going to be a different kind of busy, maybe. It may be mainly um, more of a hybrid online come in, you know, because we still have to limit the number of people come in. We don't want to right. people coming into our gallery. So it'll be a different little bit of a sensibility. But, you know, if you're in New York area or you're in a cold area, you may not want to really be indoors for four months. Uh, you might, if you can afford to, you may want to go to a place like Arizona or California or yeah. know, places. And we're finally getting our uh, Corona under and, uh, is know, it is it uh, yeah, you guys have been in a hot zone for a while is it coming we down? were a hot zone when they opened the bars and that has changed dramatically when they started mandating masks once they closed the bars mandated yeah masks, it dropped precipitously and we're still dropping so if we can continue to be smart as a community which i think they can for sure in tucson um you know that we will see you know cases go down and we'll get to a point where it's uh, you know, it's doable, especially if they do contact tracing, you know, you have to have it down to a certain level before you can even, you know, really do contact tracing. It won't work. I mean, if right. everybody has it, very difficult to do it. So we're getting there. And I think by winter, I think that we'll see a different, it'll be different. We'll still have a, every place in America is still going to have, I think this line of, you know, a steady state of numbers of cases. It's not going to just go away, period. Sure until there's a vaccination and there's enough people that get the vaccination that you can get more of a herd immunity. But you have to have convinced people to get vaccinations too, right? True. So, yeah. You know, we're we, America. We may not want vaccinations. You know, you get it, but I don't want to get it. So you know. I don't know. We we <laughs> we've we've had cases they spiked pretty hard about a month ago here, um, comparatively speaking. And then uh, you know the, the the governor came out and said don't be stupid. Wear your masks. Yeah, you know, your masks. we shouldn't have to tell you to not be stupid. Right. But but it, it's been dropping uh, pretty steadily since then. Um, I am a little worried about the start of school coming up in a couple weeks. Yeah, it's got to be very difficult for a lot. Um, but you know, it, we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. Right, <laughs> and that's the and that's why we don't name the the painting Corona. <laughs> <laughs> Even uh, though it is Corona, it might be a it, subtitle. Can we, can we make it a subtitle? Yeah, you can make it a subtitle. <laughs> Just very small. Yes. 
<laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the hour to come and talk. Actually, an hour, we talked for an hour and 20 minutes. How about that? Oh, wow. Okay. Fast, huh? Yeah. Well, hey. It's a fun time to get to know you. No, I appreciate it. I, I had an enjoyable time Good. talking to you too. So. Well, well, we'll see what's coming up next on the horizon. I like that painting in the back. So keep this me. one. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. It looks. Yeah. Better. That that's, that's the rough block in. It's still pretty rough, but from a distance, it looks okay. The one in behind you that's a little small one that's kind of a dark painting next to the guy with the sickle. Did What's you make that in the, this the one on your on your yeah, that one. That one? Yeah, was that a painting that you we're still doing this, folks. So we're gonna just pull this out. I just think it's a really beautiful little painting. This yeah, one? That's, yeah, that's a gorgeous painting. So this is uh Mount Olympus. It's just actually out my front door. This is about a mile south a view about a mile south from me. Um, but this is the mountain that's just right outside my front door. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a study, I assume. For, it's for, a study. Yeah, I've got a bigger one that's uh, about 40 inches wide that, I've, that I'm starting. Yeah, send me that one when it's done. So you, you would like this one? Yeah, that's great. Yes, yeah, so this is a beautiful little painting. Okay. Late light. It looks like late light on the mountains with dark yeah. clouds. And, yeah, and, and, in, in fact, um, I was coming back from the retinologist. Um, I didn't tell you this story earlier, but maybe I will right now. Okay. Um, uh, I had a retinal tear. I think I told you I had a retinal tear. Yeah. Uh, day before Halloween 28, 2018. Yeah, day before Halloween 2018. Uh, and, you know, when you think about how that affects your vision, it's scary. Yeah, very. And we were coming back from the uh, the laser treatment for that tear, uh, and that sunset happened, and I thought, wow, that's kind of a gift from God, you know. And I yeah. hopped out of the car and went and took a bunch of photographs of it, you know, because you only get about two minutes of that light. That's right. And uh, and I thought, okay, sometime I'm I'm gonna make that a painting, and so it's happening now. Yeah, just let's just don't call it retinal tear. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, I mean, the, the, the eyes, it's not perfect, but it's, be, it's a lot better than it was. And, and I'm glad I can still see. And yeah. And the brain actually compensates that for that fairly quickly. And, Interesting. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I got to monitor it and make sure that uh, it stays stable and whatnot. But uh, it was weird. I was just eating breakfast one morning and I can tell it, you, it looked like a shade just came over your vision. No, it, it, it didn't, it didn't completely detach. It, yeah. it tore a blood vessel. And so it looked like someone had squirted oh, yeah. ink yeah. inside my eye. Right. And, uh, and that ink just sort of dispersed inside my eye to where it yeah. got really, really cloudy. And I'm like, this is bad. So we immediately got in and got it. Yeah. That's you know. good. That's so, good. Partial tear. That's excellent. Yeah. Well, I love the little painting. We'll put a, if you send me an image of that too, and we'll put it in the, uh, the YouTube version of this podcast so people can see what we're talking about. And okay. And the big one will be coming sometime in the future. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in fact, if, if, so this one, this one will probably come first if you like this one. Yep. Um, and then the, and then this one uh, is also in process and, and uh, happy to send that one your way. If, if that's Great. Uh, one Let's you like pictures. we'll put these on the youtube and, and i've got uh this one's underway too see this is what an artist does we're really talking a podcast but they want to sell art this is really what art so, is about. oh yeah that's fantastic yeah so this is uh ben uh horseshoe ben yeah and uh and this one's going to be 48 i think it's 48 by 48 36 or something yeah. 38 38 by it's such an icon anyway it's it's iconic. pretty nice size yeah and that's an iconic image too you know i've had so, a few artists that have painted that and it, it's always such an iconic painting yeah so there's and then so there's my one for march so keep painting <laughs> so so yeah that so these are these are all like i said on the big scale of what yeah. i do so it'll be fun to sling that much paint and yeah it's funny for me as a dealer, I'd much rather have large paintings. And I'll tell you why is I know an artist can only do so many big paintings in their life, right? There's only so much time to do them. And I would much rather have the things that are significant. Um, I'd ha rather have less paintings and have larger ones that are significant efforts of their life and place those to me. That's well, 
I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I get to the point where they don't take as long as they're taking right now. Like yeah, I said, no, the last big one we had, it took a, a, what, a two days and the one before that, it didn't take very long. So, you know, they go pretty quickly, actually. But, you well, oh, you mean before you sold it? Yeah, I mean, the ones that come in, you know, you, your, your paintings have come in and out pretty fast. These ones that really hit, these big ones, they usually- Well, the, the, yeah, I mean, I, I was surprised how big Desert Sentinel, I mean, that's that, Desert Sentinel, the one I sent you, uh, when was it, November? Yeah. And, and how quickly it moved. Like, yeah. I think you sent me an email like a week later and said, we sold it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it can happen, Greg. You're a good painter. Let me just tell you, you're a good no. painter. <laughs> no, I appreciate painter. it. I, yeah. I, you know, you always feel like you're doing something okay, and then, you know, we're. I think we're all a little self-conscious. Yeah, uh, most artists are. It's true. And 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 you, and you, you know, you want people to like what you're doing. Obviously, they have to like it, or you don't make a living. But, but yeah, you you know, everybody likes a pat on the back. Yeah, it's true. All right, I'm gonna give you a pat on the back. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> go, go, go paint, baby. All, All right. right. Hey, All thank right. you, Mark. All right. We'll talk soon. All right. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.